Hello everyone and welcome to our March webinar. Uh, we are really pleased to have a special topic tonight. We're talking about gun violence. And um, our one of our own, Kyle Bruner, who is uh, from the online peer mediation platform, is going to be facilitating tonight's uh, webinar. And we will be facilitating a discussion and we're gonna show you how easy and simple this is to do. But before we begin, I wanna kinda of introduce you to the online peer mediation platform so that you know who we are. So uh, guys, do y'all see my little screen? Yes. Okay, perfect, okay. Um, so who are we? Well, we are the online peer mediation platform and this is our team members. As you can see, um, there are about seven of us and we come from different backgrounds, different organizations. Um, we always are looking for people who are interested in partnering with us, being on our team. Uh, our team does different things and I'll share some of those things with you in a moment. Just a, br a brief background about us. We were originally funded by the JAMS Foundation in 2014. Uh, we were managed by the Association for Conflict Resolution. And then in 2016, we became um, part of the National Association of Peer Program Professionals that, that runs peer programs. Uh, this is our website. You can go to our website to find our past webinars, resources, free resources, videos, um, and, different, and different information. We have four goals, basically. Um, in our platform. Number one is to provide online free resources uh, such as useful links, research, best practices, standards, curriculum, and media. And media. Number two, uh, provide online training and basic peer mediation skills. We have some conflict modules that schools can sign up to use. Um, that is actually on our website. We teach schools how to teach their students basic mediation skills. Third, we like to teach people how to um, be able to do a role play. Sometimes schools uh, need that additional practice and so our group can help facilitate that. Uh, we do have a sample of an online peer mediation simulation that's one minute that you can actually look, um, look at. Uh, so we would, if you're interested in this, we would help you with a simulation. We would help your students to brief. We would video record it and share those recordings with you and then you would um, have your students do an online survey. Um, so just a, very quickly, we would show your, you as a coordinator how to do this so that you can walk your students through this and then you guys own that material. Fourthly, this is our dream that we would have online peer mediation services for schools that don't have peer mediation. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're hoping to get there and we're very conscious that student safety is is pivotal. Um, so we also take in consideration um, that the schools need to know their peer mediation is happening. We don't have direct contact with students. The coordinator does. So if that's something maybe of interest to you, um, again, we're looking for partners out there. Um, and so we're looking for qualified mediators, educators, anyone who might be interested. We do provide other services. We provide services such as peer mediation coordinator training. It's an online class. We do also travel and um, we do trainings across the country. Organizational conflict resolution training and organization is another possibility. Um, restorative teacher student mediation is another training. Uh, we have upcoming mediator mentor training for college students who are interested in mentoring high school and middle school students. Um, and of course, you know, reach out to us anytime that you might have questions. Uh, you can again view our past webinars. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Okay. And again, this is our web website. So this is a little bit about us. So I'll stop sharing for a minute. Um, and now I'm going to turn this over to Kyle. Okay. First of all, I want to say thank you all for attending uh, this Peace Cafe. Um, I think this is a very important topic that we can have in our society today. And also, hopefully you can take this model and use this model to have even more uh, conversations about difficult subjects. But particularly this one today is about mass gun violence. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a discussion, a focused discussion around four basic topics around gun violence. And those topics are the Second Amendment, automatic guns, a good guy with a gun, and mental illness. Now, mind you, we also have some of the best facilitators that we have in this country that are on this line that will facilitate each topic. 
Um, so stand by. We also have a video that will be shown initially. Matter of fact, Cindy, do you have it queued up? I am queuing up as we speak. That'll be next. And after the video, we'll start the facilitation. Okay. Do y'all see the video? Yes. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. A school shooting in California to tell you about now, Virginia Tech. Last night, we showed you images of the campus in lockdown, students surrounded by armed guards as gunshots killed two people, one of them a police officer. It's being reported that six people are hospitalized. Their conditions are unknown. At least three people were shot. The hard facts are these. See, the sheriff's department there reporting that three people are dead in a shooting. <laughs> At two in the afternoon, gunshots ring out in this South Florida high school, terrifying students hiding in classrooms during the gunman's rampage. As soon as the fire drill got pulled, the fire line got pulled, and kids were evacuating, I heard five cops. I have shrapnel lodged in my face, in my cheek, and behind my eyeball. So I was shot directly above the knee here, and then here, 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 and then on the side of my legs is where I got lodged with shrapnel. I, I mean, I want to be a part of filming Douglas, and I want to, you know, live out the rest of my high school career normally, but there's no such thing as normal anymore. So instead of just sitting around and not really doing anything in school because curriculum is never going to resume as normal for the rest of the year, I'm withdrawing from school so that I can finish it online. In this classroom, screams of anguish as police lead students to safety. <laughs> It's kind of undescribable at this moment. Like, it's just surreal to be quite rude to you. I'm scared. Just going back into my classes and seeing empty chairs where my friends once sat and not being able to talk to them before class. And I'm just so scared. Okay, as you saw, that was some pretty sad stuff uh, going on in our country, some of the events. And I'll go ahead and start the facilitation with the Second Amendment. So my question to you is, do you think the Second Amendment either contributes or does not contribute to what you just saw? Anyone? I guess it would help for us to know what the Second Amendment says, huh? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, good. And I was just unmuting myself. The right to bear arms in this country. So one comment, this is uh, Darcy speaking. One comment that I think of is the more guns that are available in the environment certainly has an impact on how many incidents of gun violence we see because of the accessibility of guns in uh, the current day and age okay. for young people as well as um, adults. So do you think the Second Amendment actually contributes to the more guns, Darcy? I do believe that yes. And I actually live in Texas. And yes, I do believe that it contributes. Okay. I'm thinking, I'm thinking a little bit, just to um, have another comment, I'm thinking a little bit of the response in New Zealand to their recent tragedy mm -hmm. and their immediate um, change, proposal to change their gun laws regarding assault rifles. So yes, I do believe that that is a contributing factor. Okay. 
so I, I hate to pick on you or matter of fact, anybody else can, can uh, contribute, but why Darcy? They have, um, so I believe that there has always been, always will be conflict. It's how we respond to it and what is seen or um, what people become accustomed to. And so if shouting and arguing is how we resolve conflict in some cases, then people may do more of that if people believe that the other side is going to be weaponized, that people believe that they should be weaponized. And so with the um, current gun laws in the U.S. and the ability to um, purchase legally and have available um, assault type weapons that are not generally seen as necessary for hunting or just protection, not necessarily seen as just um, instruments of what is necessary for an ordinarily an ordinary citizen to need. I think that that indeed has a well it's my right to have a gun and so i need to have a gun because everybody else has a gun is sometimes the perception i know that in texas uh there are a lot of people who believe in um gun ownership and hunting season you get off the road because there are a lot of people going hunting but with the assault type weapons that are now being introduced into school settings where our young people are being um, massacred. I'm hoping that there will be some change in some of the gun laws because I believe that it just becomes even more heightened of a situation with law enforcement when they run into a room and children who may not yet be at an age where they can rationally make decisions when they're angry and they're upset or they're hurt have access to dangerous weapons okay i don't know if i answered your question no you did you gave me a lot of information probably more than i could probably digest at one time but i'll do my best if i hear you correctly it, it sounds as though you're saying that the second amendment con contribution is that it allows for people who want guns to have guns. And the more guns that we have, the more opportunity for incidents for people to get hurt because it becomes a norm. Um, did I summarize that in? <laughs> Very much so. The one point that I would add, Joe, is not just gun ownership, but it's the type of weapons that are available. So oh. those assault type weapons. Okay. In particular, and I think right weapons. I think that has a significant impact on the situations and some of the um, things that we saw in the video. Okay. So let me ask this question. Do you think the Second Amendment is clear or are we not clear on the Second Amendment? Do, or there, do there need yeah, to be some yeah, is that to me or to the whole group? That's to, to whoever wants to contribute. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Kyle, yeah. when you say, is the Second Amendment clear, like of, of the type of gun ownership or who should own a gun or? We can all go all, all of the above, really. All of the above. Well, I, you know, I live in Georgia, which is, you know, we're like Texas, everybody has a gun. I would lie and say I didn't have one. I do. I mean, because I was raised as a young girl to I lived in the woods. And so when there was a rattlesnake, you had to know how to shoot a, a, a snake. Right. So um, I don't think the Second Amendment is clear of who can own a gun. But I think that we now have the, the, the dark web and you can buy anything. Anybody can buy anything at any time. If I got on the dark web, I could have a grenade launcher at my house. 
So even in this country, if we are stopping the types of guns, there's always going to be access to weaponry that, um, that people who have evil intent will get. And that is now where we are in our worldwide community. So I even think in New Zealand, you know, hopefully they can, you know, they can continue to prevent that. But if someone in New Zealand has a weapon or they construct a weapon, which is not impossible to do, um, you know, I think that still, I still think it's going to be problematic. I wish that people had goodness in their hearts, but I think as long as we have evil in our heart and we are where we are, that we're always going to have this issue. Okay. Now, let me uh, make sure I, I'm clear. It sounds to me, if I read in between the lines properly, that you, you, I get the impression that you're saying the Second Amendment really does not have an effect on the people. I guess that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but it's the people with bad intentions, no matter what, they're going to do what they want they're going to do if they have bad intentions. Well, if that could happen. Okay. I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm taking the alternate view, I guess. Just look at it from a different perspective. Well, as you know, in these conversations, there's no wrong or there's no right. There's no wrong and there are there's no right. That's why we're having, a, um, you're posing the question. Yes. Karen, would you like to contribute yeah. at all? I would. I, and it's, I think it's so helpful to have a civil conversation and to, to know that people come from different places and that that influences how we live, our culture, and how we see the impact on law. And I was born, raised Canadian. I'm uh, an immigrant to the United States. And this is a very foreign law in my mind. It, it, I, I understand it is part of the Constitution. I understand that there's a culture of rugged individualism in the United States that really uh, shows up in many, many places. And one of those is I have the right to defend myself or to take, you know, to take care of whatever bad thing is happening to me and the gun is available to me legally. And that is not that there aren't guns in Canada, there are, but there are, there's great limitation. And it's just not part of the story. We tell each other that you would, uh, that you'd carry a gun, that you'd ever consider having a concealed weapon on you that just does not fit how you've been raised to do what you do. So I think that in my opinion, I think that the Second Amendment is, was very appropriate for you know the founding fathers for early days. I think it is, I think it's a problem I think it's, it really doesn't work to keep us safe, it doesn't protect our posterity and those to come next. I think it's just, I, I, yeah, that was, you know, that's my opinion. Okay. Let me make sure I heard you correctly. First of all, you're Canadian, um, which um, you, you, it sounded as though you said that's not part of you guys' culture actually for to have concealed weapons. And um, that might have something to do uh, with it. Also, which is interesting because it sounds like you kind of came on, on both sides of, of the conversation because it's not part of your culture and it being part of our culture, it's just part of it. But at the same time, it sounded as though you said that um, maybe it was good for them back then, but it might not necessarily be appropriate for now. Does that summarize that? Or did I miss anything? No, that's that's amazing act of listening, Kyle. Well done. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, let me ask you one more question, though, Karen. About a, a Canada, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So I understand it's not a part of your culture, but you don't have any laws in the books at all um, concerning weapons? Yes, there are. Yes, because you can't own a gun for hunting, uh, but you may not. Um, there are no, as far as I know, I don't know of any uh, law, any provinces that allow you to own a concealed weapon. Like you can't, can't carry a gun out and about. Um, and it's very tightly 
uh, licensed, regulated. Right, like you have to go through quite a ordeal to even get a, a license at all. Okay. And one last question, if you don't mind. Yes, I'll try. <laughs> How often do you guys have incidents of mass violence in Canada? I, I can't remember the last time, actually. I can look that up while we're waiting for the next call or the next question, not the next call, the next question. I'll, I'll look on the side and see if I can tell you that. I mean, I do, and I do recognize that it's, as I say, it's sort of like the New Zealand example. They have different laws that they can lean into. There's a different process that can change those laws. And I thank goodness for that. I mean, in my opinion, I think that's great wisdom of seizing a moment to tighten things up to make people safe. I mean, that is part of the role of our, our laws is to make people safe and to be, be protected. Uh, but I'll have to look up how many there have been. I don't know. Okay, I, I just couldn't think of any. I thought you might know some off the top of your head. Um, are there any other comments concerning the Second Amendment? That was an excellent Did. discussion. I'm sorry? So that was an excellent discussion. Yes, I agree. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Now, um, we have automatic guns, a good guy with a gun, and mental illness. Who would like to go next? Um, I can go next. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, I, as you guys might know, I work in um, uh, with with students that have um, mental issue, mental illness, and um, I am a licensed professional counselor. So I have a couple questions about um, the conversation between gun violence and mental illness. So does gun violence? I mean, does does mental illness contribute or not contribute to gun violence in the United States? What are, you, what are your thoughts? I, I, the, the, the funny thing is I come on, I fall on both sides of this conversation because I feel that you have to be mentally ill. Something has to be wrong with you if you want to hurt a whole bunch of people, yeah. first off. At the same time, I know there's mentally ill people all over this world and a lot of them don't resort to this act. So I don't, at the end of the day, no, mental illness does not contribute to gun violence alone. All right. So Kyle, what I, what I hear you saying is that on one hand, you have to be something wrong with you to want to hurt another individual. Yes. But you believe that there are mentally ill people who walk around amongst amongst us every day who do not hurt others. So you yes. feel like that mental illness is not a contribution to gun violence. No. Right here. Okay. Anybody else want to contribute? So I guess I have a question mm -hmm. and um, I wonder, is it Kyle? Yes. Do, do you believe that there are some people who just have what um, I think was referred to as evil intent or maliciousness in them, who consciously make decisions, who don't have mental illness, who might use violence, gun violence, as a um, way to resolve their issues. I suppose, I mean, it could be, I don't know that I know enough about it, but um, I, I think, that most people are born into this world and, and they say that as children, we have empathy naturally. And if we have empathy naturally, where does that, at what point, what does that change from empathy to wanting to hurt somebody? Um, so there are some people who, I, I won't say that they're born with bad intentions, but they might develop bad intentions over a lifetime or whatever. Well, Does that answer your question? I'm sorry. Well, can I ask a question based on that? Okay. So do we believe that maybe um, traumatic brain injuries, uh, you know, people that develop antisocial personality disorders um, who lack empathy um, may contribute to 
the rise of violence. Um, studies have shown people that have tr uh, TBI and antisocial, um, they can have violent tendencies. I believe that to be the case. And my background uh, is in, spe in special education. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that was always a huge question was, if you are trying to determine whether a child is a child with an emotional disability or with a conduct disorder, which necessarily in Texas didn't mean you had an emotional disability. It wasn't outside of your control that um, you had something going on um, organically that was um, really contributing to your inappropriate behavior and choices. Were we really making good decisions about some kids were just quote unquote kids who made bad choices and who had bad intent. And what about the kids then who, I don't believe, like Kyle said, I don't believe that kids are born bad. Or I don't believe kids are born um, with um, bad intent, but I do think that things can happen to them. And I think some of it can happen organically. And I think sometimes it can happen in terms of their interactions and things that can happen to them. I know that um, when Cindy and I uh, researched the article, we looked at how many incidents of bullying hmm. resulted in gun violence. Hmm. And some of it was just a manifestation of hurt and pain. And this is the way this person who was not quite rational, who wasn't able to reason like an adult, chose to um, express their anger and hurt. And so it, it's a question that I, I, I think about. And I do think that mental illness is a factor, but I think it's a small variable. I don't think that there's any, I, don't, I have not heard of any statistics, any data that says that people with mental illness create any more gun violence than anybody, any other sector? You know, are there gonna be some people with mental illness who create um, mass shootings or they go in and shoot people? I think yes, but I don't think it's disproportionate. I, I don't have any data. I don't have any evidence of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know what other people have seen or heard. Right. So, Darcy, you say it may contribute, but you don't believe it could be, it's the largest contributing factor. I don't think it's a, I think it's a variable. Okay. I don't think that, and I think that having access to guns because they may be available in the environment mm -hmm. may make someone choose to have that as an option, where they may not have that as an option if the guns were not available and accessible. Mm -hmm. And then that, some of that goes into responsible gun ownership and some other things, but mm -hmm. I don't think that mental illness is a causal factor. I don't think so. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you for clarifying. Karen, did you want to add anything to the discussion? Yeah, thank you so much. I, I, this often comes into conversation when after a mass shooting. You know, everyone is trying to understand the motive and what, what could possibly make someone do something so horrific. And I, I, I agree with what I've heard other people say on our conversation today. I think that mentally challenged folks, emotionally challenged folks are part of the citizenry. And I think that just because you have that, you have mental challenges doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to take up arms and kill a lot of people. And so I, sometimes that's just people connect those dots too quickly, I think. And it's maybe sounds like a, easy answer. There's no easy answers. I don't, I don't mean to say that, but I think that it's probably much more complicated than to just say, oh, we just don't have good mental health support. I mean, I don't think we have enough mental health support, but I don't think that that's the most, um, that's the variable that contributes to mass gun violence. I think there, I think it's a bigger story than that. And I feel badly sometimes when I hear 
that almost as a scapegoating where you say, oh yeah, mentally ill people, you know, if we could just take care of them, we'd be okay. Because I don't think it's quite that simple. So, so I think we all feel, um, the group feels that it is a bearable, but not a causation of gun violence. I would agree with that. Yeah. Let, yeah. let, let me say this though, because Karen brought this up and I think it's very important. I, she, she mentioned the fact that um, people use that as a scapegoat. Someone once told me, and I think it's true, that if you think you know the answers, then you won't look for other answers. Ah, uh, yeah. For real answers. So with that said, if you think that these people are mentally ill, then you won't look for other solutions to this problem. That's excellent. That, that, I'm going to steal that. That is a great, that's a great quote. I agree. I also wanted to make another comment, and that is with people who do have mental illness, though, I do believe that there should be some additional um, precautions mm, true. for when they are um, in crisis. You know, I think there's a balance between not discriminating against somebody because they have mental illness, but also um, being... Um, proactive about their safety and the safety of others. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that if someone is in crisis and someone has mental illness and they may have a history of some things that maybe they should not be allowed to purchase a gun. Okay. So Darcy, you feel, you feel like if you've been diagnosed and certainly gun ownership is not responsible. I don't think I don't think it's gonna. I think it has to do with responsible gun ownership. I think it has to do with the type of guns, mm -hmm. and I think it has to do with the culture. I think that there are bullying included. There are too many things that are going on, and I think Kyle just put mm -hmm. his um, finger on the pulse when he talked about not looking for the cause of things if you. You know, oh, well, it was this, this person was mentally ill. They've had problems forever. So that's it. Where it may have been, this person has been bullied for 16 years. Or this person has been through this type of violence. Or this person is a post-traumatic stress disorder. This person, I, and I'm not, I am not a mental health professional. So I don't want to try to um, determine what the cause might be. But there might have been several things. And I think, I think that point Kyle made was very important. You have to look at more than just what appears to be. And I think Karen said that too. The initial impression of what's going on here to really figure out maybe how we address it and prevent it. Good. Thank you, Darcy. All right, Kyle, I think I'm done with my question. Okay. <laughs> So can I then do a good guy with a gun? Excellent. Okay. I, th I wanted to do it after mental illness. So, um, and my question is, how does the idea of a good guy with a gun contribute or not contribute to the mass violence that we see? What are your impressions? What are your thoughts? My thoughts are that a good guy with a gun definitely um, doesn't, well, it doesn't, it doesn't deter gun violence, mm. put it like that. Um, because the truth is if somebody wanted, well, actually there was a couple incidents where they had a good guy with a gun and the good guy with the gun didn't go in or, um, I think those were both the situations where they didn't go in. Mm -hmm. So they get afraid just like everybody else. So to assume that a good guy with a gun is going to stop when all this craziness goes off is a terrible mistake. Because then again, here we go. Somebody who thinks they have an answer will just put a guy with a gun in the schools and that's going to be a solution. Mm -hmm. And it's really not. Because truth be told, truth be told, if there was a good guy with a gun, and even if he was brave, he'd probably be the, he might be the first one taken out. Then what do you have? So Kyle, what I'm hearing is that just saying that the person 
who has the gun who's a good guy does not solve the problem. It doesn't necessarily mean that that person, what I think I heard you say is, it doesn't necessarily mean that that person is going to go in and be the hero and be able to um, un- disarm the person who is the aggressor. And it doesn't mean that even if they attempt to do so, if they don't, like everybody else, have human feelings and get scared or whatever, if they do decide to act, it doesn't mean that they're going to be successful. Exactly. They might also be another fatality or another um, casualty. Did I get that right? Absolutely. Okay. Great job. But I, so, have, I have to take the um, opinion, though, that there have been instances where we've had good guys who have gone in and saved many lives and have given their own life so that other people can live. I mean, we've we've had incidents of that um, that have occurred. So. So it can be sometimes where you have that one person that sacrifices for the mass um, to save others. Um, You know, many lives have been saved. So I I will have to say sometimes a good guy with a gun can, I I would like to have a good guy with a gun. (laughs) If I'm in a school right now, you know, Um, if someone was coming in, that would be very helpful. I, I, I don't have any recourse, at, you know, other than that. So okay. that might be my only hope. But that could be, it could be um, a, deter, a determinant. Well, let me ask this. Do you think that it would actually deter somebody from committing these acts? Depends on how bad they want to hurt somebody else. I think if uh, they really want to do it, they're going to do it. I really believe that. I don't think anything when you, when you're at that point, unless, you know, you get in a wreck to wherever you're going or something like that, or you get sick, you know, um, that they're going to do it. Um, Those maybe that have a, "Mm, I don't know. And they see someone, maybe the SRO, Maybe they won't that day, but that doesn't mean in the future they won't. That helps. Yes. So, Cindy, part of what I heard you say is sometimes the good guy with the gun has really been the factor that has saved lives or helped people because they have acted and they have been successful and um resolving the situation and being in a school setting yourself. If there was an incident, you would like to know that that would give you a sense or a feeling of more security, knowing that there might be a good guy with a gun who would be able to step in to a difficult situation. Did I get that correct? You did a perfect job. Okay. And, and I would like to just share one example of where that was true. It was in Thousand Oaks in California. There was a shooting at a pub and there was um, a security person that came in and he was killed as well and did, you know, sort of s- slow it down, but was over overwhelmed. Sort of what you said, Kylie was one of the first to go because you know, they were ready for him. And I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction. Um, I, I worry that we think that a good guy with a gun will cut down on gun violence. And um, I, I think that's, I'd like to know that there's more stories there, that it's really made it better. But I, I think that Oh gosh, how do I even say this properly? I think that that's part of the problem with our best guys with guns are police officers. And when they uh, enter a situation, they have to worry about who has, who is the, who's got their good guy shirt on and who's wearing their bad guy shirt that has a gun. How do you figure out who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? And so I'm okay with police officers having lethal force, but I find it just, really risky or too risky for other people to take on that role of vigilante or whatever. I just think it's really, really hard to pull it off. And, and 
in, in, in Houston, uh, Darcy, I forgot, no, no, um, Dallas, there was a mass shooting. Isn't that terrible? I can't even remember what year that was. And I recall some of the news coverage after the fact is police officers were there and they were ready to respond and they looked around and there were so many people with handguns and other guns and they didn't know where, where was the, you know, where, what was the source of, of this problem, of this violence, and they really were strapped to, to respond. Um, so I find that it makes it harder for our real good guys with guns to do their job when there are so many other people with guns. And, and one more comment, I'm sorry to make this complicated. I mean, we lived in Houston for a little while when my husband was at University of Houston and a news story I saw was about home invasion. And there was a you know, former uh, convict, uh, convicted criminal who did this, you know, help the police after he was let out of prison. And he said, that is the first thing that a uh, home invasion person is looking for. Like your television is big. It's hard to get out the door or other things are cumbersome and you can't turn it over. But if, if a home invasion, if a thief gets in your house, that's the first thing they're looking for is a handgun because they can sell it really well, really easily, get a big bunch of money. And it, it's, nobody even knows that they've committed a crime when they leave the door because they're not hauling stuff in a bag out the door. So anyway, that's, that's my opinion about the good guy with the gun. Let's say, okay, and Karen, you brought up something I was going to ask a question about. So I appreciate you making it more um, complex because I think it is indeed a very complex issue. So what I heard you say initially is that, yes, it sounds like there are some situations when there have been good guys who have been heroic, who may, as um, Cindy said, gave their life, but they were heroic and they were instrumental in resolving um, a bad situation. However, that good guys with a gun may actually complicate the situation when law enforcement arrives and then you have multiple individuals with guns and then in that split second decision making, how do they um, determine who's the good guy and maybe who's not the good guy, who's the aggressor and how difficult that might make it for law enforcement who are, your terminology was, the real good guys to determine how to proceed um, appropriately without maybe injuring the good guy with the gun because they weren't able to identify that person as a good guy. Um, and then the other part of it was you gave that specific incident and I think there were incidents in Killeen, Texas, there were incidents in different places. You said. Uh, Dallas, maybe you said the Dallas area, and uh, where the actual situation was just what you described. The police arrive on the scene quickly, but then the issue is, who's a good guy with a gun? There are so many guns here, how do we determine? And so that makes it much more difficult for them to be able to do their job and resolve the situation safely. Did I miss anything? Because you made, but I thought that was very important because I think that is a very complex issue. So I'm glad that you brought that um, into the forum. Anybody else? No. Karen. Okay. okay, here we go. So my prompt is, how do automatic guns contribute or not contribute to mass gun violence or mass shootings and gun violence? Well, I guess I'll go first again. <laughs> In my opinion, automatic guns absolutely contribute to mass um, gun violence because by nature, they're automatic. So you get to shoot more people than you would if you had or something that wasn't automatic. Um, that's all. <laughs> so my restate's easy then on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so Kyle, I heard you say that you are, I think quite clearly that by definition, an automatic rifle contributes to mass shooting because of its physical power. It, it you can shoot more than once. It's and, ability. 
Yeah. Well, I, I have to agree with Kyle because uh, as being a former history teacher, uh, when automatic weapons were created during World War One, that was their purpose because you didn't have to reload and, you know, what you had to do in Crimean War, Civil War. So that was the purpose of the machine gun was to get as many casualties as possible. Um, it is a shame that, you know, it has morphed into our, our society as this, you know, symbol of prestige for some people to own an automatic weapon. Mm -hmm. um, and, and many people that I know will brag that they have automatic weapons and what type they have and where they come from, from China, from Russia, whatever. Um, and they're very, um, you know, there's a whole collectorship that goes around it for sure. So not everybody that owns, and I don't want to say that everybody owns an automatic weapon is a, a, a bad person because a lot of these people are collectors and they, you know, they don't see it as weaponry. They see it as a, a symbol of something, you know, a antique that they're going to pass down to their family. But I think the whole nature of the history of the weapon, that it does contribute to mass casualties for sure. Excellent. Thank you, Cindy. That, that's a, that's an interesting perspective to look at it historically that the ability to do rapid fire was built for combat when you were looking for a takedown. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, that automatic weapons in current culture are, can be seen as a symbol of prestige or a collector's piece um, and has sort of taken on a new role and status. Does that make, did that sound right? That was, that was yes. very well summed up. So I want to agree with Kyle and Cindy. I think um, mass automatic weapons definitely does contribute. I think I talked a little bit about it earlier when I said assault type weapons. I think they're called weapons of war in some cases. There have not been established why there's a need for ordinary citizens to have access to those and be able to maybe um, have those available to them when they are going from place to place. Um, Cindy, I thought that was excellent that you brought up. I had not thought of the historical perspective mm -hmm. that, you know, for some people, this is something that, oh my goodness, this is, you know, a weapon that was used just like we have other you know, mm -hmm. statues and things that we memorialize because of the historical value and implications. So I hadn't thought of that, but I am really concerned because I believe that without those automatic weapons, Parkland might mm -hmm. indeed have been a tragedy, but maybe not 17 students. Santa Fe High School might have been a tragedy but not as many, Newtown. All, I think that, and I don't know that Newtown was automatic, because sometimes it's multiple weapons and sometimes it's automatic weapons. Mm -hmm. But I do believe automatic weapons are a huge issue that needs to be addressed and that they have a huge impact on the amount of mass gun violence. And it makes it, um, when we talk about a good guy with a gun, if there's an automatic weapon, Kyle and I think Cindy and maybe Karen, you also talked about how that good guy with the gun might be one of the casualties or one of the early casualties and maybe won't have had as much impact with an automatic weapon. And then two, if it is a child whose ability to reason is poor mm -hmm. and they're hurt and they're angry, but they have access to this weapon, their expression that is anti-violent violence may be exacerbated because they have access to an automatic weapon, so they may do much more damage than they even intended. Mm -hmm. So I think it has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. I hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I heard you say, Darcy, is that um, uh, thinking about what is the need for this weapon in um, the you know in the hands of citizenry and um, that is it, it's even called a weapon of war in some sales or or classification of weapons. You made the point that 
even even though there was if if in these mass shootings if the shooter had had something less ferocious or didn't shoot as many bullets that there would be still death and hurt but not at the same level and a number of casualties had the weapon been something that didn't fire automatically and so you in your opinion you see that this is a major contribution to uh, mass killings that the automatic weapon is is a is a contributing greatly to that <laughs> i don't know about that was, that was not a very good restate sorry <laughs> Yeah, that was correct. B minus on that restate, but <laughs> but I think I think I heard you. <laughs> Did well. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> awesome job. Good. Now that that pretty much concludes it for right now, the the piece cafe. But what I want people to understand or get most importantly is that it was we had tough conversation about tough topics. We able some of us fell on to a couple of different sides, and that was okay. Mm -hmm. You were heard, and your opinion was restated so that people know for sure that you were heard. So hopefully you can take this model and take it and have and use it to help you have difficult conversations in the future. Now, also, Cindy, didn't you have something that you said you wanted to tell us that could help us prevent a um, or benefit us in a mass shooting situations? Yes, and I think the big, the big thing is to train people the signs to look for because the signs are there. In fact, in the Sandy Hook research, they said that before many of the mass shootings, someone said something. There was an indicator. Something was on social media. Something was said to a teacher. Something was said to a parent. So there is a, Sandy Hook has um, this really great training program for students called Say Something, but I think adults can also use it. Um, it is, you know, what to look for, uh, what to do, and how to report. Because oftentimes we don't report because we don't want to be wrong. We don't want to look foolish. Well, the days of looking foolish are over. I mean, if you don't say something, then these are the repercussions of what happens. So, um, so there is a, let me share the website very quickly with everybody so that you know what it looks like. Um, pull it up right quick. I, I just trained my students on this. Can y'all see it? Say something resources. Can y'all see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's uh, www.sandyhookpromise.org forward slash say something resources it is no cost. So that means it's free. There is a toolkit, a planning guide, uh, videos. Um, and my students just actually went through this training uh, because we are on the prevention side. We don't want to get to intervention or postvention when we have to pick up the pieces or we're in the middle of a active shooter. Uh, so being on the prevention side is the best side to be. So I did want to share that resource. Thank you, Kyle, for letting me do that. Let me do that. Wonderful. Now, um, are there any questions? Mind you, let me let me be clear. We did not solve all the problems in the world in this one conversation. And this one conversation doesn't mean that we got to the answer that would solve this problem. But it's the beginning, and that's what I'm thankful and glad for. Are there any questions that you have? So, I'm okay. oh, sorry, Darcy, go ahead. Um, Kyle, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. And I want to thank you for um, coordinating this Peace Cafe. I think there is a need for this. I think there is a great need to be able to have people have a peaceful discussion and maybe even a debate because not only do you get to hear another, another side that may open your eyes to something, but it's a way to um, resolve some issues without the just hateful kinds of behaviors that we're seeing occur just because people have disagreements and people have had conflict forever, right? Absolutely. So I really appreciate and thank all of you mm -hmm. for doing this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kyle, I, I, I second that. Civil discourse needs to be taught to our students. Yes. And I think that this is something students can do. The earlier you can do this, the better. So Absolutely. thank you for so much for bringing this 
tonight. I agree. Me too. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That was thank amazing. you for participating. Well, this concludes our webinar for tonight. So thank you everyone for, for watching and please share this with your colleagues. Uh, we will have other webinars uh, in the future with um, online peer mediation platform. So stay tuned and thank you again. Good night. Good night.